and welcome to our members and guests to this, our second quarantine special. This time we're going to be using items from the Great War Huts collection to tell the story of British military millinery of the Great War. In other words, hats and helmets. And I'm going to say right from the outset, it's not going to be comprehensive. The British Army used hundreds of different types of headgear throughout the war for all sorts of weird and wonderful specialist roles. This is going to be a very simple overview of the basic types of hats and caps and um, just to tell you when they're introduced, why they're introduced and, uh, and what superseded them basically. Um, and I think it's also worth saying that the study of hats and caps of the First World War can be very useful if you have an interest in, uh, in family military history for instance or collecting postcards because the type of headgear being worn uh, can very often date a picture or even if it doesn't give you a specific date it can often rule out dates or, or at least position the photograph in a particular time frame or show that the soldier's doing a particular role. So with any luck it, it might prove useful. So as with so much about the First World War and the study of it we need to wind back to the end of the Boer War. The lessons learnt in South Africa uh, for the British Army were huge and after the South African War virtually every single part of the British Army was reorganised. Uniforms, equipment, weapons, structures, organisation, drills, right up to the creation of the general staff. And hats and headgear were no exception. In 1894 the British Army stopped wearing, except for Scottish regiments, the, the Scottish Glengarry which had been very popular with Queen Victoria and introduced a very simple, very plain field service cap. It's pretty much exactly the same type of cap that's going to be introduced again in the late 1930s for where we battle dressed during the first part of the Second World War. And these field service caps would see service all the way through the South African War, right the way through that period until 1901, when as part of that reorganisation, the decision was taken, quite surprisingly, to introduce this, which was referred to as the hats all ranks, universal, service dress, um, to you and me it's a slouch hat, um, but in army terms, hat, because that's what it is, all ranks, it was going to be worn by officers and other ranks, universal, it was going to be worn at home and overseas uh, in service dress, so uh, that's the khaki drab uniforms, khaki drab all uniforms. Um, it was pretty obvious quite quickly that it really wasn't the, great, uh, the greatest thing for wearing with service dress at home, so the slouch hats uh, disappear quite quickly and within a year a new type of headgear has been introduced and that would be this little fella the uh, forage cap new pattern or Broderick as it was known uh, which I think it's probably fair to say certainly in its time was the most hated piece of headgear that the army ever introduced um, has that look of a sort of a sailor hat, uh, has no peak which was its biggest failing so when you're trying to fire your rifle on the range or, uh, or on field days or, um, or, or on exercise or, or in theory even in combat you hadn't got anything to, to shield your eyes to the point where it actually had to have a khaki cover tied over it with a peak in order to fulfil that function. Um, they came in all sorts of different colours depending on the regiments and corps. Uh, the non-royal regiments, which this is, just a plain dark blue one, uh, had different coloured peaks for different regiments. The, the yellow peak here of the Norfolk Regiment, uh, Suffolk also had a yellow peak, the Bedfordshires. Um, so it, 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 different colours for, for different corps, different units. And the badge was actually fastened to the peak, to that separate peak. Peaks just held in with a hook at the top, uh, so you could take it off to clean the badge. Um, and basically it meant that one basic design of hat could be used for you know, all of the non-royal regiments and then just customise them with the changing of the peak. This particular one belonged to a, a Norfolk regiment soldier, John Green, the first Norfolk, so he was issued this in 1906, uh, which was pretty much just as they'd run their course. Um, a, a new cap had been introduced in 1905, but the, um, the Broderick hung around a little bit longer. Uh, the Royal Marines kept it for quite a bit longer than that. The, uh, certainly the Royal, Royal Marine Light Infantry in the Royal Naval Division uh, go to Antwerp wearing them. Um, and, um, and I think uh, that the Royal Marines carried on using the Brodericks uh, pretty much right the way through to the end of the war. Uh, and King's Company carried on long after that. So um, it, it, it did see a fair amount of, of service, but as far as the army was concerned, then pretty much 1902-1906 is it for the Broderick. In 1905, at long last, to go with the rest of the khaki drab uniform, 
the uh, forage pattern, <laughs> forage cap new pattern with peak uh, is introduced, um, uh, which was a, a much needed refinement. At long last, there was a peak so you could uh, sensibly fire your, your rifle in the sun and the rain. Um, this particular one, uh, made in the First World War and uh, worn by a fellow called Charlie Wheaton of the 9th Londons. Uh, and again, quite a scarce piece of headgear nowadays. Um, it, once the troops got to France, it was obvious quite quickly that these caps had a bit of a problem in that they'd got this very, very distinctive profile, which in half light or, or if you were backlit, would very, very easily give your position away to a German sniper. Uh, and likewise, not only that, the top being this perfectly round, flat shape would mean that as fellas were moving around, in amongst leaves and trenches, it very, very quickly would give you position away as well. So before the end of the year, the instructions had come to take the wire out of the tops of the caps, uh, take that wire stiffener out to give the thing uh, a much more floppy shape so that this time when you're wearing it, you can have the thing pulled down into all sorts of shapes. It doesn't have that distinctive giveaway shape and nor is it going to be giving you a position away by having lots of uh, round discs as the men are moving around. It just sort of blends in, just looks like rustling leaves. Quite early on, during the retreat from Mons, we see all sorts of, uh, of temporary adaptations like this. The, uh, a neck curtain, uh, that, uh, that August blazing hot sun in the August and September, uh, and these neck curtains just tied on uh, to protect the, the backs of the necks to stop fellas getting sunstroke. Uh, this particular one belonged to a fellow called Harry Beck of the Royal Field Artillery and Royal Garrison Artillery, um, and his also had a, a khaki cotton cover tied on the top as well, um, which you see all sorts of weird and wonderful adaptions quite early on, which, uh, which, which disappear quite quickly as the war progresses. Officers had their own version of stiff service dress cap. I mean, the, uh, the officers' stiff caps had been introduced in 1900 in dark blue. Um, 1902, they get a, a khaki version of it, khaki uh, whipcord one to, to match their new khaki service dress. Uh, and again, very, very similar, stiff top, perfectly round stiff top, and just a, a slightly more stylish peak. And this very thin leather chin strap with the leather adjusters at the side. Now this type of leather chin strap was originally the style that was also worn on the other ranks caps, uh, but very quickly was replaced with the, the type with the brass buckles that we're more familiar with. And again, the same thing with the officers caps, those wires start to come out the top just to break the shape down. On the outbreak of war, um, as you know, the British Army had no helmets as such, uh, but they had before the war. There were two types of helmet, as far as the British Army were concerned. There was the Foreign Service helmet, which was worn on foreign stations, as you might expect, sometimes with a khaki cover, very often with a, with a pagri wrap around it. And there was the Home Service helmet, or sometimes called the Blue Cloth helmet for obvious reasons. This particular one was issued to a, a fellow called E.J. Brown, who was a private in Second Suffolk. He was issued this in July 1914, uh, so obviously he had hardly any wear out of this before uh, he, he went off to war, and he was killed at Wehrstrat in March 1915. Now, these were worn, uh, as I say, for home service, so for situations where the army might be called out as an aid to civil power. So, for instance, in the miners' strike in 1912, Second Suffolk was sent up to Chirk Colliery in, in North Wales, and they wore their full khaki wool uniforms with their 1908 webbing, rifles, bayonets fixed, and they were all wearing these home service helmets because it's part of that whole image. I suppose in a way it's a bit like a police helmet. It's about giving you height, it's about giving you authority, it's about giving you a bit of dominance. And so even though most people would find this quite surprising, this was the helmet that the British Army wore on the streets of Britain when keeping peace and, uh, and civil order. Of course, nobody in their right mind would send their army off to war with a helmet with, uh, with, with spikes on the top, clearly. Um, towards the end of 1914, um, as the winter was getting, uh, was getting closer, the British Army introduced a new style service dress cap, the Winter Trench Cap. Now, the Winter Trench Cap, uh, nicknamed the Gore Blimey, um, was intended really, I suppose, as a cap come balaclava. So for that first winter of the war, the flaps could be slackened off on the top and the whole of the back of the cap could then be folded down and turned into, literally, into a balaclava. So 
it would keep your ears warm when in the trenches. Now, the, uh, the obvious problem with that is that when you're on sentry duty, you can't hear anything. So it's very, very, very rare to see photographs of soldiers actually wearing these in the style in which they were intended. I've got a handful of photographs of fellows of 4th Suffolk's at Reichsburg at the beginning of 1915 wearing them like this, but, but that is the exception rather than the rule. They weren't popular at all. Very often you see them with the flaps cut off and, um, and uh, th th they disappear quite quickly. Um, this particular cap was issued to a fellow called Careless uh, of, of, the, uh, of the first 20th Londons, and he wore this in France in the first few months of the war. And, um, and then he was fortunate enough to get himself posted to, uh, to, to, I think, the Somerset Light Infantry and goes off to India for the rest of the war. So this is quite a remarkable survivor. It still has bits of candle wax on the top where obviously he spilt candle on it, uh, bits of candle wax on it in his dugout. Um, the officers had a similar version, slightly more stylish, but the basic principle is the same. So you see here the sort of the, the, the flap at the back, fastened by a very neat strap and buckle arrangement at the front, and again, exactly the same sort of design, uh, a very soft, very floppy, warm fabric, um, and there's a lovely letter for, or an order, I should say, from the uh, commander of the Essex Regiment Depot at Warley, complaining that there were officers wandering around the depot wearing this type of cap in the in the uh, in, in the sort of summer of 1915, and complaining that they need to get back to their proper stiff top service dress caps because they're not on active service in Warley. So that's the uh, that's the the winter trench caps. And also fair to say, this is the, uh, the, the only cap that should be referred to as the trench cap. I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, the other people who wore service dress caps quite early on were the Australians. Uh, most people, will, when we think of Australian troops, when we think of the diggers, will think of the slouch hat um, because it's so distinctive. But when those first contingents actually go overseas, when they, they're heading off to Gallipoli, the Australians actually have their own version of the service dress cap. And the only difference with the Australian version is that it has a piece of leather banding around the front of the peak. Apart from that, it's a pretty much an identical cap to the one that the British soldiers are wearing as well. Uh, obviously, very quickly, these get replaced by the slouch hats, which become much more distinctive. But just worth mentioning that very often you see troops at Gallipoli wearing stiff caps, and there's often an assumption that they're Brits. But if you look very, very closely, you'll often see that they are, in fact, diggers. The Scottish troops in 1914 nearly all have a Glengarry, a version of the Glengarry. Um, these came in all sorts of uh, colours, some of them plain, dark blues, dark greens, uh, all with different coloured dice bands on depending on the regiment. Uh, and all of them share exactly the same problem in that, again, there is no peak, so it's very difficult to see where you're aiming your rifle in bright sun or in the rain. Um, there are some great photographs of the 51st Highland Division in Bedford. Uh, in, uh, in 1915 with a curious cover that sat over the top that looked a, a bit like a trilby which, uh, which provided shade uh, and a peak at the front but they don't seem to ever have uh, reached the front line in fact they don't seem to ever have reached any further than Bedford um, but that was a, a fundamental problem with the Glengarry uh, Glengarry's kick around pretty much to the end of the war a lot of fellas hang on to them um, for sort of walking out as their best dress but in terms of front line use it's a pretty useless piece of headgear and at the beginning of 1915, the first step in the right direction when the Balmoral bonnet is introduced. So these are quite a small, uh, quite a small piece of headgear in their original form. They were in dark blue with a with a tourie on the top. Uh, this particular one's a, a, a Tyneside Scottish version. Um, and the instructions come out that these were not to be worn in the front line until a khaki drab cover had been made for them, which, which obviously this is. And the advantage of the Balmoral is that it at least does have some kind of peak to shade the front, shade your eyes when you're, when you're trying to fire your rifle. But again, they're quite small. And by the May of 1915, really the, the, uh, the, a much better solution has arrived with the introduction of the first Tamashantas. And these first Tams, which are pretty huge, I have to say, uh, absolutely perfect. You can see to fire your rifle, keeps the rain and sun out of your eyes. And although the Tamashantas and Balmorals run alongside one another for a while, in the end it's the Tamashantas that, uh, that, that do that job until the introduction of the steel helmet. 
After the introduction of the steel helmet, then the size of these huge tams gradually start to shrink as their, their main function for keeping the sun and rain out of your eyes is no longer necessary. And, and the tam shanters will, will see service right through until the end of the war. So I've mentioned the steel helmets. Um, steel helmets are... Uh, something that takes quite a long time, considering the amount of, uh, of shrapnel that's being used, the amount of ball bearings raining down on, the, on soldiers in trenches, it takes the British quite some time. The French are off the mark first with the Adrian, French Adrian helmet, um, a, a, a design which is copied by plenty of other nations. The Belgians had them, the Serbians, the Italians, the, the Russians and all sorts of other people. Um, uh, it was a fairly complicated thing to make. It was made in uh, in two pieces uh, with, with, with the crest fixed to the top, riveted together. And of course, the downside with that was very often if it caught a blow at the wrong angle, the thing would literally fly apart. But what it would do, it would slow down shrapnel bullets or, or, or shell splinters. So um, even though none of the First World War helmets were, were bulletproof, uh, uh, the, the even if a, a round did penetrate it, it would very often take most of the sting out of it and stop it being a fatal wound. So the British, throughout the summer of 1915, are looking for um, different designs, different ideas, and eventually uh, choose two different patterns of helmets to trial and eventually go with the familiar style that we see now and placed an order for 25,000 of these um, in September 1915. Um, they were a, a very very simple thing to make, a, a simple pressing and again not bulletproof by any means. Uh, you, there are no shortage of examples of these with, with massive holes in but a lot of those saved the lives of the people who, who were wearing them at the time. Um, Nowadays, these are often called Brody helmets, um, which is, a, a, again, it's a, it's a modern term for them, really. Uh, and the reason for that is that the original liners inside um, have a red stamp in which says Brody's helmet liner patent. Uh, and Brody actually took out the patent for the liner, so that Brody relates to the liner, not the helmet. Uh, so, uh, as far as the soldiers of the time were concerned, these were either um, steel helmets, these were shrapnel helmets, or in Tommy terms, these were just tin hats. So, um, so w when you hear people refer to them as Brodies, that's, that's very much a, a modern reference. When they're first introduced, um, they're, they're just intended as a trench store until there's sufficient numbers. So they would literally remain in a trench and as units came and went, they would be left behind, handed over. And they were issued to, uh, initially to, to machine gunners, to snipers, to runners, to people who'd be exposed you know, more, more than the fellows who, who sort of spent most of the day sort of sheltering and keeping out the way. Um, by the May of 1916, they've pretty much been introduced across the board to most of the frontline units. In their original form, they have this very, very sharp, um, unprotected edge. We call this, this the, rimless, uh, the rimless helmet. Um, and you can imagine bumbling around in the dark, clonking into one another, you know, cutting in mate's nose and all that sort of stuff. Um, and in their original form, the very early ones were, were a very pale sort of apple green colour. And... Uh, and James Jack in, in uh, General Jack's diary refers to the fact that when the troops came out of the line they were expected to clean all this down, polish them all, see so these very very shiny tin hats in their very shiny green and of course the minute you went back into a trench it made you a target so fellows were getting killed. So the, the answer to that initially was to cake the helmets in mud. Uh, if you caked it in mud it would tone it down, it would stop it shining uh, but it still gave you a problem because the outline, the, the outline of the steel helmet was, was every bit as, as lethal, if you like, as the, uh, as the outline of those early stiff service dress caps. So very, very quickly, a very simple adaptation, starting off by just covering them with sandbags, um, but very quickly um, sort of making up proper helmet covers for them, uh, just out of hessian or, or, or khaki drill fabric. Uh, it stops them shining, it breaks the shape up, makes them very, very difficult to see. So by the end of 1916, most, but not all, frontline troops will be wearing helmets with covers most of the way through 1917. And that really doesn't change until after the, uh, the, the, the 8th of August 1918, suddenly during the campaign of the 100 days, when it really doesn't matter anymore because it's a war of movement, uh, that you're, you're not in static positions. Um, and so uh, a lot of troops by that time ditch the covers and most of the fighting in 1918, you see them just wearing the sort of standard, um, standard steel helmets. The later type, 
had a rim fitted to, around the edge to stop that sort of sharp, uh, that, 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 that sort of sharp edge cutting into uh, into your mates when you bumped into them in the dark. Having said that, there was a dear old veteran, <coughs> Captain G. B. Jameson, a Royal Artillery officer, um, and he had two scars that ran across his face diagonally. And, uh, and I can remember at Peron in 1996 uh, asking him, I said, I hope you don't mind. Uh, would you mind telling me how you got your scars? And he said, oh, yes, 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 yes. He said, uh, he said they, they came from my own steel helmet. He said it, it was caught a glancing blow by a piece of shell splinter. He said and it literally flicked the rim clean off the helmet and wrapped it twice around my face and cut my face open. And those uh, the scars that he still bore all those years later, uh, to the fact that um, that the uh, something that had been intended to protect soldiers from one another uh, had actually done more harm. Um, this particular tin hat belonged to uh, to Captain Kennedy of the First East Surreys, um, and it's also worth mentioning that as the war progressed salvage increased enormously so instead of uh, continually producing new helmets helmets were, were reworked they were they were restored they were uh, rejuvenated they'd be going into workshops all across France um, having new liners fitted being repainted having new chin straps and later on painting with a with a mixture of paint and sand to tone down to give them a sort of a dull finish so that they didn't shine um, I think in uh, September 1917 something like 17,000 helmets had been um, had been reconditioned in one month, which just gives you an idea of just how much of that work was going on. And of course, that's not to say that uh, that later helmets weren't uh, that, that that the early helmets without the rims weren't still being processed because they still still being worn uh, right right to the end of the war as well. But um, but it was a phenomenal amount of work to uh, to save money because at the end of the day, a uh, a reconditioned helmet would, would cost a great deal less than having to buy a new one. And actually, there was nothing wrong with the steel. While on the subject of helmets, just briefly, we'll touch on the Germans. Uh, the Germans, a Stahlhelm, uh, which is introduced sort of later in 1916, uh, a much bigger, much heavier helmet, um, made of clearly thicker steel. Um, but of course, that comes with problems in its own right. It's a much heavier helmet. It's a much more cumbersome thing to wear. It comes down lower over the years, and that gave a problem in its own right because you get this constant wind rushing noise. Um, and in fact, very often these the horns that you see on the top here, got to sort of bolt holes, holes straight the way through. Very often you'll see them filled with mud um, because you just get this sort of constant, almost white noise, noise sort of sort of rushing past you all the time. Um, again, even though they're thicker steel. Same sort of thing. They will shatter if they're hit at the wrong angle. Um, but um, but again, they uh, j just a, a different solution to the same problem of how to stop head wounds. With the introduction of the steel helmet, the British Army had a bit of a problem because even their caps with the wire removed still had a hard peak and a hard cap band. So what do you do with the cap when you're in the front line? Because you couldn't fold it up and put it in your pocket, you couldn't stick it in your pack because it was just too bulky. Um, the solution in March of 1916 was to introduce a soft cap. So it had no wire in the top, but instead of having a hard peak and a hard headband, it has just the cloth, but it's strengthened with lines of stitching. So those uh, the lines of stitching are what give it its strength and its shape, but it has the advantage that you could literally screw it up, tuck it in your pocket, tuck it in your pack so when you come out of combat it might well or out of your period in the trenches it might be a 10 mile route march back to your billets now if you haven't got a hat then you're going to have to wear a steel helmet all of that way so this meant that you could come out of, of the front line you could get to a place of safety the helmets could come off the caps could go on and you could march back in relative comfort um, nowadays these are erroneously referred to as trench caps by dealers, collectors, and all sorts of people that uh, really ought to know better, because these are the only cap of all of the service dress, uh, all the versions of service dress caps that were never intended for wearing in trenches. So, um, so uh, that they are and remain the 1916 soft service dress cap. The officers had their own version. Again, pretty much the same sort of stuff. They did still have a, a hard peak on theirs, but again, the body of the cap has no stiffening in it. The top's got no stiffening in it. And again, they, they were very, very popular because again, it enabled you to get that sort of, you know, fresh out of trenches sort of look, which uh, which 
the, the, the great joy with all of this stuff to soldiers were the ability to take something which is meant to be uniform and all the same and customise them and make them all look a bit different. Um, Customising was quite a big thing. Um, we get examples uh, here of, uh, where are we? This cap belonged to Albert Weber. Um, Albert was an interesting fella. He'd, uh, he, he'd been in the Royal Engineers. He was then posted to the Royal Naval Division. He then comes back to the Royal Engineers. He's then posted to the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry. He then comes back to the Royal Engineers. I think it's probably fair to say that, uh, that Albert Weber was a bit of a handful and, uh, and uh, COs were quite happy to send him back from where he came. But if you look here, he's braided his cap strap. Again, all of these little tweaks just to, to make your cap look a little bit different, make it stand out. Um, there's another here that uh, belonged to a, a soldier of the Canadian 44th Infantry Battalion. And you can see what he's done. He's taken spare cap strap buckles and fitted them to the side of his cap strap just to bling it up a bit. Uh, again, a very, very common thing to do. And this cap um, is a version which is introduced late in the war, 1918. Um, I don't know whether it was to save on wool, I don't know what the specific idea was, but in 1918 they introduced a version of the soft service dress cap made out of gabardine. So at the time they were quite a hard wearing waterproof piece of kit. Uh, nowadays they very often suffer the, um, the, the, uh, the fabric frays and so their survival rate, even though there's a lot of them about, there's, uh, most of the ones that are about are in quite a poor state now. Uh, but again, exactly the same design as the, uh, as the earlier drab wool versions, but this time just made out of gabardine. In hot climes, troops in Mesopotamia, Palestine, Gallipoli, Salonika find themselves wearing the, um, the Wolseley Sun Helmet. Um, these were first introduced during the South African War for officers in, in 1900 and in 1904 they were issued across the army for other ranks. A very very practical cork helmet with quite a wide sort of peak and, and a brim that runs around the side, much wider than the old uh, sort of South African War period helmet. Uh, with, a, with a nice long tail on the back to keep the sun off the back of your neck. Although even then there were uh, additions, you, you sometimes see them with these uh, quilted covers which were put over them to actually increase the, the, the area to keep the sun right off. You certainly see this, uh, certain troops wearing these in Mesopotamia, so it really does create a, you know, you're almost standing in your own shadow all of the time. Um, and these helmets had a, a puggery on them. This, this particular one's probably a, a, a post-war one because it's not very fat and chunky. The wartime ones were very thick. Um, dear old uh, Fred Castle of the 5th Suffolk's, he served in Palestine. And uh, I can remember Fred telling me that they were issued with the sun helmet with no puggery on it. And they were then given a, a large square piece of cloth, uh, which they then had to neatly fold and stitch into place. And uh, he said that was, that was a, quite a lot of fun. Um, and the intention was that every day, if you had the chance, you would soak it in the, in the mornings and the afternoons uh, with water and that that would help keep your head cool for the rest of the day. He also said that it was a very popular thing uh, to use these as pillows. So what they would do, they would literally punch the top in, they'd break all the cork up, and then at night use this as a pillow to sleep on, and then in the morning just push the thing back out again because it'd hold the shape because it's all held in place with the, with the khaki cloth. Um, and, uh, and this is what they used throughout the, throughout the uh, campaign in Palestine to, uh, as their pillows. You sometimes see photographs of troops, a, some, a set of photographs of troops at Gallipoli wearing them backwards so that they've got this at the front to, to make an even bigger peak uh, at the front to, to keep the sun out of their eyes. And there are also photographs where they've snapped the back of the peak off so that the, 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 the tail at the back will hinge up because, again, when you're laying in the prone position, very often as, as you... As you sort of go to lift your head up, the, uh, the pack on your back will tip the helmet forward over your eyes. So a very adaptable piece of kit uh, and these will trundle along in, in British Army service all the way through the interwar period. Um, so late in the 1930s the, uh, the, the flat tops at Bombay Bowler or the, the uh, solar topies were, were introduced but these are certainly still around well into the Second World War uh, and, and providing practical service. In Salonika in 1916, uh, there's a shortage of these. I think uh, there was a big contingent or consignment of them which were heading for Salonika, which got redirected elsewhere or got nicked uh, when they were due to be delivered. So you often see photographs in the, uh, 
in the early part of 1916 of troops in Salonika wearing a version of the of the slouch hat which again uh, yeah very very practical piece of kit the slouch hats made out of felt and again the idea was that you could fill the thing full of water first thing in the morning uh, and um, and and again later in the day and just soak the whole thing right the way through and you put it on and it keeps your head cool it's a very very simple idea as the war came to a close um, the army starts getting back into its sort of pre-war soldiering so even though this service dress cap was made in 1921 it's still made as the soft service dress cap so with the stitch peak uh, with the stitch band but it's a grenadier guards cap and of course they've put the stiffener back in the top to get straight back into that sort of smart water that sort of pre-war look um, and uh, and so the, these will be kicking around for a little while in 1921 the army has a complete reorganisation. Uh, the, the uniforms, the, the tunics, the trousers, the caps all change. Um, erroneously, often called the 22 pattern, the 1922 pattern, although there is not a single garment that the British Army ever wore that was 1922 pattern. Um, they were, in fact, pattern NS for pattern new specification from 1921. So, uh, so if you hear stuff referred to as 1922 pattern, uh, which is often done by people who should know better, um, they're just plain wrong. Pattern NS from 1921. And it's worth comparing it because the, the original stiff cap from 1905, a very smart, with that very small, quite stylish looking peak, a uh, very practical piece of kit. And then the, uh, the, the, the 1920s version with this big, ugly duckbill peak. Uh, other differences, the, um, the early one, as we know, perfectly round at the top whereas the 20s cap had this sort of oval top to it uh, all in all a, a much less pleasing uh, piece of headgear um, a, a, which I think is probably also true to say of most of the rest of the uniform the stitch peak caps still carry on for a while the um, this one was issued to a, a Suffolk regiment soldier in the early 1930s for training so they were still used at the depot um, for, uh, as a sort of everyday sort of working cap, uh, although obviously they would have a, one of the new you know, pattern NS caps for, their sort of, for the best. Um, so they still had a function. And in fact, the Royal Marines had to be dragged kicking and screaming uh, out of these in, in about 1942 and, uh, and finally updated because they quite rightly saw these as, a, as actually a far superior cap to the, uh, to the field service cap that replaced them, um, which, as I say, cropped up in, uh, in the late 1930s. This particular one belonged to uh, belonged to the, the father of Colin Woods, who's the deputy chairman of Suffolk Western Front Association, and he wore this in the Home Guard in Suffolk. So, uh, so they they were a they 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 were a, 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 an unusual piece of headgear, I suppose it's true to say, because you cut, you sort of you put it on and you just have to kind of balance it and hope to uh, and, and hope for the best that it will stay on. So a very odd thing to replace um, a, a, a you know a, a decent cap with and. In about 1943, certainly by the middle of 1944, most of these have been replaced with the general service cap, which was sort of a, a khaki, or it looks like a beret, although it isn't. Um, other things to say about First War headgear, the, the Royal Flying Corps, um, certainly those commissioned into the Flying Corps and, and, and the other ranks, of course, wore a version of the, of the field service cap. Uh, this particular one belonged to a Suffolk Regiment officer who was then uh, transferred to the Royal Flying Corps. Um, and... Also, uh, general officers, senior officers. Um, generals actually wore a dark blue cap most of the way through the war, which then had a khaki cover fitted over the top of it. Um, so for brigadiers up to, to field marshal, this, this type of design with the two rows of braid, field marshals obviously had a different badge. And the coloured bands, the staff bands, depended on what branch of the service you were with. So scarlet for infantry, uh, um, uh, um, green for intelligence, uh, cherry for medical services, etc. Um, so you could tell which branch of the service this particular officer was part of uh, just at a glance. Battle patches, uh, battle insignia, painted on helmets. Um, this particular one, the Yellow Castle, uh, we know for a fact that Yellow Castles were worn by uh, the 1st Battalion Suffolk Regiment, by the 2nd Battalion and also by the 1st 4th. What we don't know is what the design of those three different helmets were, uh, so I'm not sure whether this was a 1st 
second or fourth battalion helmet. Um, but they, uh, the intention was that it, 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 it gave you a sort of a mark that you'd be able to distinguish units in the field. So very often uh, going into combat, uh, the helmets would be worn backwards with the badge at the back, so the brigade commander looking through his binoculars would be able to identify units by either helmet flashes or flashes worn on the back of the jackets or on the sleeves. Um, and the, the whole scheme continues after the war. Uh, this particular one, the badge will be familiar to many First War enthusiasts as the badge of the 34th Division, although I can honestly say I don't think I've ever come across an example of a photograph of one of these helmets being worn with that badge in wartime. What there are is a lot of photographs of them being worn by the Army of Occupation in Germany after the war, by which time they'd ceased to be the 34th Division and it was now the East Anglian Division. So I suspect that this is one of those. Uh, and interestingly, uh, even as late as 1919, 1920, it's a rimless uh, early steel helmet, which has obviously been um, reconditioned at several several points in its time. Um, but like I say, the there are wartime versions which are specifically battle patches, but post-war you often see them really as sort of unit insignia uh, just to help identify units. And certainly 4th Suffolk's, there are some cracking photographs of 4th Suffolk's in Germany wearing helmets exactly like this. So, I think that's pretty much it. I think that uh, that's given you hopefully some idea of, uh, of how the headgear of the British Army evolved and changed throughout the war and how they adapted in different, uh, in different theatres for, for different purposes. And um, I think all that's left to say is I hope you have a good month and I'll see you next time.